this video we'll be looking at the final part of this booklet, looking at capacitor discharge. Now capacitors have an exponential nature in both charging and discharging. We know that when we set up a circuit like this on the left, the electrons are going to flow around the circuit until we get a buildup of negative charge on one plate where the electrons are gathering and a positive charge on the other capacitor plate where the electrons have been leaving. And that flow of current will gradually decrease as greater charge builds up, as more electrons on the negative plate repel incoming electrons. So you eventually hit a state of no current flowing as the capacitor is fully charged. Now if we swap out this cell with something that we can conduct through, such as a resistor, as there is no other power supply, the capacitor will now discharge, releasing all of its gathered potential difference and transferring electrons around the circuit from the negative terminal to the positive. And as a result, you gradually lose the negative charge and consequently the positive charge until no current flows. Now this means the current would have been higher at the start and at the end, diminishing to nothing. And this is very much true when we were charging as well, as initially there was no opposition to the flow, whereas later that opposition increased as the negative charge built. Which means we can represent this graphically with a current against time graph to show this exponential decay, very much like you'd find for a half-life graph. So this graph is true in both cases for charging and for discharging. Now this implies that there will be other graphs that are not the same, but for current they are identical. So the other two graphs to care about are potential difference and charge. So let's have a look first in red with the idea of discharging as this is the major one to look at. We know that initially we will have our maximum potential difference as the capacitor is fully charged. And as it loses charge, it loses potential difference. And that means it will gradually diminish. And naturally, the charge graph will be identical because we've just referenced the fact that the charge on the plates is representative of the potential difference. However, if we look at this for charging, we obviously start with zero potential difference and zero charge. So we'll gradually increase the potential difference present until no more can be collected, no more increase, plateaus. And the same will be true for the charge, as less electrons can be added to the negative terminal it will gradually reach a stopping point. So these graphs are obviously inverted, but at least identical between potential difference and charge. Now time constant is a basic mathematical value that we use that is given as a simple equation on the data sheet. In terms of definition, it leads us to a weird idea where it's the time taken not for half the decay, which we had with half-life, but for an unusual 37% remaining. So we're looking at the time taken for the charge to reduce to 37% of the original full charge value. Now luckily, mathematically, this is much easier. We can use this symbol tau, but the equation sheet doesn't reference it as such, it just references by name. But it is given as RC. So T, or tau, for the time constant itself, which is just measured in seconds, it's time. And that is the resistance in ohms 
multiplied by the capacitance in farads. So this is a very easy value to work with, and it can be something you're asked to find. So in which case, you need to remember that RC as a combination is the time constant. Now, if we think graphically, looking back to these graphs, if we do the QT graph, showing our exponential decay for discharge, if we treat it just as you do a half-life decay, we know that the top value will be the maximum charge, Q0. If we drop all the way down to 37% of that, so roughly here with 0.37 of Q0, we can draw a dotted line across to the actual curve, and then do a dotted line down from that point. And the point at which we end up on the x-axis, as it represents time, will give us our time constant. Very simple stuff. This could well be used in multiple choice questions, especially where they might be trying to mislead you with the idea of half-life, or even asking you to find the half-life of the capacitor's charge. So be very careful with it. Now the real challenging part of this topic, all in all, comes down to this equation. The equation for the discharge of a capacitor is given as Q equals Q0 e to the minus T over RC. So this is almost identical to the style of equations dealt with in the radioactivity topic, where Q is the charge at time t. So it's the charge we want to know right now, at this point. Q0 represents the initial charge, which we can assume to be the full charge of the capacitor. And both are obviously measured in coulombs. t is the time at which we are taking the measurement. So it's the time you care about. And on the bottom we have RC. Well, we know that that is the time constant, resistance multiplied by capacitance. So we've got two time factors here showing what's going on. Now, you are also given an equation for the charging of a capacitor. Now, it makes sense to think about that as the total charge minus the equivalent of the discharge, so the amount of charge that hasn't yet happened. So this is given as Q equals Q0, and then in brackets, 1 minus e to the minus t over rc. So if we expanded these brackets, we would have Q0 minus the discharge equation. So it does make sense logically. It's just there to help support you, if need be. Now very often what you're expected to find is either the time or the time constant. Now let's give time as the example one to show the use of logarithms here. If we rearrange ever so slightly by dividing both sides by Q0, we end up with Q over Q0 is e to the minus t over rc. Now through application of the natural log, we can eliminate the exponential factor and bring that power down. So we can say the natural log of Q over Q0 is equal to minus t over rc. If we multiply both sides by minus 1 over rc, we can get t on its own. So we know that the time that this discharge is carried out in is minus rc natural log of q over q0. Now I don't recommend memorizing this, but knowing how to effectively use natural log for these sorts of equations, both for capacitance and radioactivity, is massively important for the harder hitting questions, the ones worth more marks. Now similar to the radioactivity topic, you are given one version for charge, 
but you can also use this equation structure for both current and potential difference. So i equals i naught e to the minus t over rc, and v equals v naught e to the minus t over rc. Very easy to use, you just need to remember that they are also applicable. And that's it. Thank you for your time.